Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on football finance, the global landscape as part of the Sports Investment and Financial Summit uh, from the ISC Virtual Week. I'm delighted to say we have two uh, experts with us uh, today to have a look at this topic uh, with us. First of all, uh, Andrea uh, Satori. Andrea has been working for KPMG since 1994. Uh, in, since 2015, he's been the global head of sports and during his career within the sport, leisure, tourism and lifestyle real estate sectors, Andreas performed assignments in more than 35 countries. Uh, joining Andrea today is Dan Jones. Dan Jones is the uh, global lead partner for sports business uh, with Deloitte and Dan's been leading Deloitte's work in sport around the world. He heads up the firm's specialist sports business group and spent the last 20 years working full-time as a professional advisor to the sports um, industry. Uh, welcome to both of you uh, today. Thanks very much for joining us. Let's just have a look, if we will, first of all, at the overall status of, of the football industry now and how it's perhaps changed, obviously, dramatically, some would say, in, in recent years. Um, Andrea, on alphabetical order of your surname, your, your Christian name, starting with A, let's, let's go with you first. Um, what, what's your take on where we are just at the moment in, in, in the football landscape? Well, first of all, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Andrew and Dan. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Well, when looking at the industry, um, the football industry, I say that recently, in the last 10 years, has possibly changed more than in the previous uh, 50 years. So there has been uh, uh, a complete change uh, derived from the growth uh, of uh, media, particularly OTT platform, the fact that basically football has become accessible at low cost, if not for free, basically throughout, uh, throughout the world. There has been a change in terms of regulation with the intervention of financial for play. So if you look at football, how it was uh, in uh, 2010, and you compare it how it is uh, today, let's say pre-COVID, let's leave aside what has happened in the last uh, eight, nine months, uh, there has been a sort of, uh, of a revolution. And that is also uh, demonstrated by the huge growth of revenue, by the overall improved level of profitability of clubs. So the year in which uh, financial fair play was introduced uh, in the industry, uh, the aggregated profit at European level um, where they were actually making loss of 1.7 billion euro by 2017 the aggregated profit were in excess of 500 million euro so there has been a huge growth revenue has almost doubled in approximately 10 years and also the enterprise value uh, over the years has significantly growth we have been monitoring in it since 2016 and the annual growth uh, over the four years that we have monitored has been 11 percent per year for the top 32 european clubs Dan, is that a similar sort of uh, take a, that you would have on on where we've been in the last ten years? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I would agree with um, a lot of Andrea's um, perspectives, and and uh, thank you, as Andrea said, for this opportunity to debate. It's great to uh, to have the chance to do so. So I think it's right to separate sort of you know what was happening pre-COVID um, from you know what we're currently living through, and, and I guess maybe to have a bit of a glance forward to to what might happen post and. The sort of growth that that Andrea was reflecting there, you know, clearly agree with all of that and and agree with the patterns that we've seen. I guess the the financial fair play aspect is really interesting and and the wave of new investors who've come in because I think probably the biggest change in the last ten years is you know we had spectacular revenue growth in in the ten years that preceded that, but as fast as revenues grew, costs and in particular wage costs grew even faster. So uh, yeah, you had this extraordinary industry where it had revenue growth that was outpacing anything, you know, any other industry would kill for that sort of revenue growth, and yet was making bigger and bigger and bigger losses. And so for all the criticisms that it can attract, the financial fair play move, you know, the, the, the results are very self-evident in, in the numbers that, that we see for profitability. And that in turn has attracted new investors, and those investors are also interested in, you know, running profitable, sustainable um, businesses. We've then obviously been hit by this this current shock and i guess the really interesting question is what happens next and my belief is still very very strong in the fundamentals of the industry um 
if you were to create top level football today, if you were sitting in Silicon Valley and you were thinking, right, got a load of startup capital from somewhere, what am I going to make? If you could make top level football, if you could make unscripted drama that works globally, that has to be consumed live, that aggregates an otherwise atomized audience, that people will engage with on social media, that people will have a great passion and loyalty to and will happily pour their data in for you to do analytics on. Yeah, if, if you created something like that, it would be at the head of the herd of all the unicorns. It would be the greatest invention for the modern digital era that anyone could come up with. And yet we already have it and it's been going for 100 years and it's got a well-established business model. So I think the fundamentals are still extremely attractive. You know, not to in any way diminish the stresses and strains that we're all living through at the moment and, and the strains that's putting on the business. But, you know, hopefully if we move on from this in a, in a year or so's time, we're back to normality. I think we, we, we come back into an industry that remains incredibly strong. And we'll come on to COVID and, and the impact, because obviously it's impossible to avoid the impact that it's had and the impact it's going to go on to have, I dare say, uh, in the future. But give us an idea, Andrea, if you will, who are the investors at the moment? You know, we, we tend to think that we know the big name sponsors that have been around the Champions League, you know, the Amstels, the Heinekens. We sort of see those names appearing all the time. But um, perhaps behind the scenes and, and your expert knowledge between you and Dan on this, um, in, in terms of the big corporates and, and the big funds, who is actually behind the investment in football? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, let me say that I do fully agree with what Dan has said about the strength of the fundamentals of uh, of the industry, which of course is going through difficulties, many like many other uh, uh, sectors of the the economy. And one important point to make is that the interest of uh, various institutional investors, from uh, private equities to family houses, was well present uh, before COVID. And the interest of those international investors were there for the reason that have been mentioned in different ways, both by myself and Dan. So the fundamentals of the industry are strong. There was a significant revenue, revenue growth, uh, profitability. The, the business model of football clubs always presented uh, uh, some flaws because uh, we are basically operating in an industry where at European level, pre-COVID, you have a staff cost to revenue ratio of approximately 60%. There were some exceptional clubs operating well below 50%, like Bayern Munich, but there are uh, several clubs operating well above 75-80%. Um, but the industry has been growing. Of course, there has been a huge growth of, uh, of media revenue, and that has attracted pre-COVID the interest of several clubs. So there was a time in 2017, 16, 17, 18, of a lot of interest of Chinese investors, a lot of American investors coming into the market. And uh, in 2019, there were 45 transactions in first division club in Europe um, that uh, regarded either a sale of a minority or a majority, a majority stake. In 2020, we have seen also the, the growing interest of uh, this institutional investor being private equity, being family offices. I can think, for example, the Commiso family in Florence, the Fretin group uh, in Rome, um, and many other transactions that has happened during, uh, during the year, like, for example, Bordeaux, um, Charlton, Vegan. Um, all of this, uh, it's, it's happening because I do believe that, yes, prices value have decreased because of COVID. There is certainly an issue of liquidity, but because the investor, as Dan correctly say, do believe in the strong fundamental and in the growth prospect of the industry. Dan, I mean, you, you have a role in this. You, you, you edit Deloitte's um annual review of football finance and, and the football money league so you too have got a really good idea of who is playing the game at the moment in terms of the uh, behind the scenes the investors is is that your understanding too from uh, from what andrea said yeah i mean there's i guess there's sort of three facets to to, to what you consider to be um investment in the game um there, there are sort of the big corporate interests as, as you mentioned andrew there are the uh, investors actually buying up the clubs, as, as, as Andrea um, mentioned. 
Um, and then I'll sort, of, I'll sort of start with the third because that's the most fundamental, which is the, you know, the fans. So all, all the revenue that comes into football clubs, I mean, people talk about football clubs becoming dislocated from the fans, but the reality is that, you know, whether it's ticket money, whether it's merchandise, whether it's sponsorships, you know, who are the sponsors trying to connect with? Why are they sponsoring these clubs? Whether it's broadcasting, you know, it all comes back to, to, the, to the fans. So the, the, the key investors in the game where the money is ultimately coming from is the fans, but sometimes by slightly circuitous routes. That in turn drives the the corporate interest. So, you know, it's no coincidence that, you know, someone like Amazon um, is getting involved via Amazon Prime because, you know, the, the rights, for example, they acquired in England to the Premier League, you know, happen to coincide, the games happen to coincide with Christmas. Um, and there was no coincidence in that because it, it, it sort of drove subscriptions to their Amazon Prime platform and you know their their view is that the more customers they can get to that the more data they can get and that people once they've got that service they don't churn out of it so we're seeing an evolution of the model of, of where those um, corporate investments might come from but a lot of the same big names are still around you know that you mentioned a number of consumer brands at the start that they remain very interested in investing in football they think it's a great way to reach an audience and in some ways an audience that's otherwise hard for them to reach as I said, the games are going out broadcast live, you know, in a world where most people are, you know, watching the TV on catch up and, and watching things on box sets, you know, for advertisers to find a way to cut through with broadcast advertising is increasingly difficult. So being affiliated with, you know, live sport, and live football in particular is a great way of doing that. On the investors of the type that, that, that Andrea mentioned, um, so you, you, you sort of mentioned and made me feel old by saying how long I've been doing this. The, the, the route I came into this was I worked in corporate finance in the 1990s. And so my very first football work was in connection with clubs listing on the stock market here in England. And so, you know, it, it feels sort of somewhat like ancient history now. But basically on, on the wave of a load of growth in pay television, um, lots and lots of clubs came to the stock market to access capital. They, they were having to you know, rebuild stadiums post the Taylor report here in England. And so, you know, we had, uh, I think at the peak, we sort of had 20 listed football clubs in England and followed by, you know, a number of clubs from, from continental Europe as, as well. Yeah, fast forward it to where we are now, you know, we've, we've gone through a wave of all of those delisting, going back into private ownership, but that private ownership going from being local high net worth to often global ultra high net worth. Um, Andrea alluded to the wave of investment we saw from China. You know, there's been waves of investment from the states. We, we see private equity interested. And then, of course, we've got the newest phenomenon on the block, which is the um, special purpose acquisition companies, the SPACs, which could be the big story of 2021 in terms of these. The, the, there is a huge amount of money out there for investment generally at the moment. Um, and there is, of course, because of COVID, a huge need in, in the corporate world, including football clubs, for investment. So you've got a sort of wall of money out there waiting to be invested and you've got an acute need in some cases you know immediate need for investment so i think as as we've said you know i don't see any signs of that activity slowing down what is interesting of course to those investors now that has evolved over the last 10 years is that previously those were trophy investments they were emotional investments they were perennially loss making and yet you could still sort of make them make economic sense because uh you know an anecdote from someone I talked to circa 10 years ago about buying a football club that that was someone who already owned a, a franchise in the US and when I was sort of taking them through the economics and saying look you know you need to understand this is likely to cost you money every year you own it that that, that is the reality and he said no no I get that he said oh, the team I own in the US people told me it's the worst thing I could ever do with my money to buy a team you know why not just buy a better quality of box and enjoy the game and he said you know it's lost me money every year I've owned it for the last 10 years and now it's worth five times what I pay for it. Mm -hmm. So that that's the rationale, you know, there's a capital gain rationale. Because of things like financial fair play, because of a newer wave of investors now, actually they aren't necessarily costing you money each year you own one of these clubs. Clearly COVID years, it costs you a lot. So, you know, the, the attractiveness and the appeal of football clubs as investments has only increased in recent years. Um, and I think, you know, when we come back to, you know, investors are looking at the future and what's going to happen in the future and, and again going back to those fundamentals i talked about i think they remain you know very very confident about the about the future and therefore are keen to invest we've mentioned um ffp um already but 
Andrea, do you think that, you know, is there an imbalance? I mean, it would seem you mentioned about the amount of interest that there was in um, 45 transactions in first division clubs around Europe, or among the elite leagues. Um, but below that, lots of clubs um, across Europe in particular uh, are struggling and um, obviously a different system in the States with a with sort of franchise system of ownership. But, but generally speaking in Europe, the... Um, underneath the tip of the iceberg if you like uh, th there are difficulties for a lot of clubs how how does football address that um, that imbalance if you like in terms of competition how will smaller clubs ever become uh, the barcelonas the real madrids the manchester united's um, whilst finance is perhaps tipped in favor of these uh, established big clubs mm -hmm. Uh, before answering your question, let me complement uh, uh, what, what Dan has just said about the evolution of the market and somehow the interest of the capital market in football. Basically, the, the growing interest of certain institutional investment in the football industry has been driven by the fact that we have moved away from what they used to be, let's say, non-profit, community-based type of organization of a few decades ago to proper enterprises uh, uh, operating in the entertainment and media media industry with more stable cash flow and uh, in many cases or in certain cases with attractive profitability and that's what has driven very much the interest of of investor into the football market over the past uh, uh, the past recent years because basically football clubs have become a new attractive class of asset while uh, up till uh, let's say seven ten years ago they were considered simply uh, too risky and most of the investment that took place uh, in the football industry were very much uh, emotionally emotionally driven answering your question uh, regarding the competitive balance uh, i think that if we look the 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 results the sporting results in various national league and especially if we look at the results in the european competition uh, it is pretty clear that uh, somehow it's more or less always the same team winning for example the champions league uh, or qualifying for the the, the round of 16 uh, quarter final semi final of the of the champions league and we had a perfect example again last night if we take the round of 16 of the last three years there is only one club which is actually porto that this year qualify for the round of 16 there is only one french club psg last year none of the club outside of the big five qualify for the round of 16 and two years ago uh, only sorry three years ago in the 1890 season only two clubs so the time when in Europe you would have seen uh, Ajax uh, winning the Champions League not to talk about the Auer Bucharest uh, Red Star Belgrad uh, are basically gone so if you take the last 10 years only one non big five team which was actually Ajax in the season 1890 arrive to the to the semi-final of the Champions League. If you look at national leagues, you look at who is winning in Germany, in Italy with Juventus, uh, and also in a smaller country, like for example, you take Croatia, uh, Dinamo Zagreb has been dominating for many years, Salzburg, uh, Red Bull Salzburg has been dominating in Austria. Uh, the more you win, the more money you get, uh, the better player you can buy, and sort of a, of a uh, virtuous or vicious, depends how you look at it, the circle basically, basically start. So there is an issue, how can we actually um, basically, to a certain extent, um, avoid that? It's possibly to better solidarity or increase solidarity uh, mechanism to support a smaller team, smaller, uh, smaller league, and I do believe that one opportunity exists in the creation of uh, regional leagues. Um, if you look at which are the big football market, uh, the big five European economies, it is as simple as that. Those are the economy with, in which you have, of course, a high disposable, a relatively high disposable income and big population in which you can sell media rights at a significantly higher value than in traditional strong football market like have been Portugal, Belgium, the Netherlands, 
uh, in the past uh, in the past many years. So if we would create a regional league with a critical mass of uh, um, people uh, to which uh, rights could be sold, media rights could be sold at, uh, at a certain uh, value, which is comparable to the one of the big, big five, or at least closer to it, I think there would be more competitive balance. It, it's just of one idea of many that could be, uh, could be considered to, to address this issue, which is definitely existing. Andrea, thank you. Dan, I mean, there is a feeling, isn't there, I think, amongst football fans in particular, that the, the rich are getting richer and, and the, the, the less rich are, uh, are more struggling. Um, you know, how do we address that if, it is, if that is indeed the case? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, the, it's interesting the way you phrased your question as well, Andrew, because um, people, people do talk about the rich getting richer, and, and that, is, that is true, um, you know, excluding COVID. I think yeah, that's been clearly the, the trajectory. Um, the, the, you said the, the rest are struggling, and I think that was very accurate and careful wording, because what the, the classic quote is, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer, and that's not what's happening. You know, there, there is, you know, there was, you know, up until March, more money in the game at all levels than there had ever been. So, you know, taking a very English view of it, because the, the data is very readily available around the sort of, um, you know, the, the top 92 professional clubs in England, you know, they're, there's always a lot of talk about, oh, well, is that too many clubs and it needs to come down? Uh, yeah, actually, you can do the maths pretty easily as to how you can sustain and run um, a professional League Two football club in England. Clearly, it's going to run at a fraction of what a top Premier League club runs, but it, but you know it's a it's a tenable business model, and they've moved to introduce um, salary caps uh, in, in the course of the pandemic in, in League Two and League One in England, and that's definitely a part of you know making that model sustainable. To your point about competitive balance, I mean the the, the vicious virtuous win cycle that that Andrea uh, mentioned is you know very well very well recognised. I, I guess I've got a couple of uh, sort of flickers of hope I think around that. One is, you know, people who often talk about, well, look, you know, it makes it all just too predictable and, you know, that then the, the interest will go and it will sort of, you know, drive the business down and, you know, it will go into a, a downward spiral. I, I'm less convinced by that because I think that, um, you know, people tune in to watch a, a game. They don't tune in to watch a season, they tune in to watch a game. And um, because of the nature of football, that it is somewhat unpredictable, that it's a generally low scoring sport, you know, you do get surprising results all the time. You know, every every weekend, you get surprising results every Champions League match day. You might see a surprising result over the course of a season. These things tend to even themselves out, and the, and the top teams tend to tend to rise to the top. I mean, we're in a quite an interesting period at the moment. I was looking at the the league tables just this morning, and as a I'm talking to you from Manchester, um, you know, the, the the one club that sort of slightly bucked uh, Andreas' trend there about you know the the biggest and the richest clubs being successful in the Champions League is is my own club. <laughs> Um, you know, two very, very exciting matches uh, against uh, PSG and, and uh, Leipzig, but uh, unfortunately, from my point of view, at least not, not the right results. But from the point of view of people who want competition, want uncertainty of outcome, want exciting games to watch, it, it, was, a, it, was, a great, it was a great situation. And you've currently got, you know, the two Manchester clubs sitting sixth and seventh in the Premier League. In Spain, bizarrely, which, you know, has always been a go-to market for a lot of us to say, look at the predictability, look at the imbalance. You've got, you know, Barcelona struggling down in ninth. You've got Real Madrid in fourth. So, the the joy, I guess, of, of of football is that whilst over the long term the phenomenon we've been talking about of um, that competitive imbalance definitely holds true and the economics sort of prevail. On on the short term and at the shortest term, you know, on any given match day, um, you know, that 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 uncertainty is there. I, I think the idea. That, that Andrea was alluding to there of, of regional leagues is a really interesting one. I mean, clearly the the topic of a European Super League, which we may come on and talk about, um, is one that obviously comes up a lot, has come up on a pretty regular cycle. Again, not coincidentally matching to the UEFA rights cycle. Um, and that's one where I, I have lots of reservations about whether that would actually be a good business proposition, let alone whether it would be a good thing. But the regional leagues idea again is a very interesting one. You know, the the, the idea of an Atlantic league involving, um, you know, Scotland, Holland, Nordic countries, and even um, you know, Portugal has been around for sort of 20 years or so. What one league idea that does seem to be gathering some traction at the moment is is the sort of Bena Liga idea, the idea of Belgium and the Netherlands coming together. So, you know, clearly quite a break with tradition, but you know, interesting interesting concepts to uh, to be explored. 
and just a final final point i think on, on competitive balance is financial fair play gets a lot of criticism for locking in the existing order and not bringing about competitive balance it is worth remembering that financial fair play wasn't brought in to achieve competitive balance it was brought in to achieve financial sustainability where i think you know it, unless you really want to fly in the face of the statistics you'd have to say there's a there's a big tick has gone next to that um the competitive balance issue is a, is a different challenge and the ch structural changes you need to make to a sport and its economics to really truly level the playing field in that way are, are, are a big challenge what's been interesting is some of the most successful competitions through the way they distribute central revenues have been able to achieve that and i think again it's it is no coincidence that the Premier League has fed its own virtuous circle of relatively equal distribution of those central revenues, therefore enabling teams throughout the league to get better players, therefore generating greater competitive balance, therefore making it more attractive to viewers and generating more revenue and so on. So again, a, a, an interesting case study that I know lots of other leagues look at and think that would be great, but I'm not quite sure how we get there from here. Just to get there for Andrew, 20 I, I think history. sorry may i complement what andrew uh, what, what um, um, dan has just said is absolutely correct uh, in relationship to the mechanism of distribution of the media revenue and that's why the premier league has been much more exciting than other european leagues but the other thing he said on which i agree 100 percent is the fact that to certain extent the uncompetitive balance is a collateral effect of the introduction of financial for play so it, the fact that in the past uh, you used to have uh, the tycoon that could put whatever amount of money within a club and there was not the need of respecting the break-even rule, which is actually the fundamental, um, let's say, point of financial fair play, is the most important, uh, uh, I would say, regulation within the, com the complex uh, regulations of financial fair play as to certain extent uh, limited the, the level of competitiveness um, of, of certain clubs. You take a club like AC Milan, which was a very, very glorious club, and this year is coming back quite strongly, at least in the Italian league. They were they have been making losses for so many years, and there wasn't any more Mr. Berlusconi injecting every year tens of million into the club to buy the best player and, and therefore to compete at the international level because you simply cannot spend more than what you are actually generating. And that's the biggest limitation. And that's why I say it's a sort of a side effect of collateral effect of the financial fair play introduction. Let's, um, well, I do want to come on to COVID because obviously it's not only so topical now, but it's also so key to what happens in the future. But let's just explore if we can a bit more about what changes perhaps you would have en envisaged happening if co if COVID hadn't uh, come and uh, taken its place amongst us all? Um, where would you be in terms of developments? So we just talked there, Dan, briefly about the idea of a, a, a European um, Super League. In, in terms of UEFA and, and the FIFA, um, how much of a hold do those governing bodies still have over the clubs? Do you sense we are perhaps closer now Dan, than ever to clubs um, breaking away to do their own thing? Is that more of a possibility now than it perhaps has been? We started this by talking about the amount of change that's been in the last 10 years. It, it feels like it wouldn't be a surprise to many football fans if they woke up one morning and the news was the clubs were going to run their own Super League. So it's an interesting one. And as I said, this this topic has come up. I mean, as we talked about, I've been doing this since the late 1990s and, and it's come up uh, on a regular cycle during that period. So that the original sort of um, Project Gandalf, so-called the Media Partners Initiative, uh, you know, I was around at, at the time of that. And the, the momentum behind it and the, and the motivation behind it is, is pretty evident. Um, what's equally evident is that it keeps coming up on a cycle and it keeps not happening. Uh, and I've always believe that it would continue to not happen there's always a danger in that you know i've been right about that a number of times but you know you, you're always right about it until you're wrong um but at the moment I, I still think that it won't happen and and the reasons for that are you know it, it's pretty difficult to do actually if you once you start getting beyond and into the actual detail of how would this work you know what would be players position with regard to national teams what would happen to domestic football where would UEFA and FIFA sit on this? Where would the individual national federations sit on this? You know, 
why would clubs take the risk? You know, that there are all sorts of challenges and issues and so on. And then on the other hand, you have people saying, well, look, you know, it would enable you to have a closed league. It would enable you to have some form of financial regulation. It would make it a more NFL style model, more attractive to investors, et cetera. But, but I do think that you know, the, the, the logistics of trying to make this happen are considerably more complex than generally gets mentioned. Also, I, I thought it was interesting that the latest reports I've seen, you know, the ones that came out in recent weeks, sort of talked about there, you know, being a five billion pound scheme. Well, you know, or five billion dollars, I think it was. You know, I, I sort of assumed they'd missed a zero off that number because that doesn't begin to move the dial to get something like this done. Yeah, you, know, you look at the deal that's just been done in Italy, 10% of the media rights with CVC for, you know, what is, you know, we can argue about whether it's currently the third or fourth biggest league in in europe so you know the idea that you can rally the entirety of the top of european football to some sort of long-term high risk breakaway with with just that sum of money is um you know that that wouldn't buy you one of the top individual clubs so yeah it's a long it's a long way off um and i think from the point of view of the, of the clubs i mean I, I talked about who invests in the game you know coming back to the fans you know what are people really interested in and i think at the moment they have a european super league there is a European Super League already in existence. It's called the UEFA Champions League. It runs in parallel with national competitions. It's phenomenally successful. And for those big clubs, um, and again, you know, I mentioned the clubs very local to me, you know, a big part of that brand uh, and the appeal to their fans and what they, you know, what they stand for is about winning. And therefore being in a European Super League that, you know, can only ever have one champion every year you know, it's not great for those clubs to finish 8th, 12th, 13th, three years in a row. That that doesn't take them forward. So I think the current balance is right and it's good for the clubs and it's worked well. So it's a bit of a dull answer in that I'm saying I don't think that much will change. What always does change, of course, is this, uh, this stalking horse, this spectre at the feast is always there to make sure that in any negotiations that happen between the clubs and UEFA about how the Champions League works and what model it uses and how revenues are distributed, it, it's always there in the background, whether even if it's not spoken about or it's only spoken about by others. And, and that means that that competition continues to evolve and I think it will continue to evolve, but I think it will evolve within the wider sort of superstructure that it has for the last 20, 30 years um, of a UEFA run top level club competition running in parallel with national club competitions and I think actually coming all the way back to it fundamentally that's what fans want to they they like the balance you know I was on a call with people I used to play football with who've been friends of mine for 30 years last night and you know they are West Ham fans and Spurs fans and Liverpool and Manchester City and Manchester United and I don't have those same interrelations with people who support Real Madrid or AC Milan and so on. So you've got to kind of remember what the public actually wants as well. Uh, Andrea, let's have a look at it. Perhaps if you would, I know from the global perspective is your interest, but also domestically with, I'm in, interested in that Italian angle because I certainly, you know, grew up through the, through the area where um, but we, we, we've heard just, just recently of the sad passing of Paolo Rossi. But, you know, for many years, the Italian teams, um, be they AC or Inter, be they Juventus, uh, Napoli, they, they were really the top teams throughout Europe. I mean, is there a fear in Italy that if there was to be this sort of NFL style closed off league, um, would, would the top Italian teams be able to take their place in that league, do you think? Well, from a from a sporting performance perspective, I think certainly certainly yes. But I think the the underperformance of uh, uh, this from a sporting perspective of many of the Italian teams at the international level in the last ten years, uh, in which only Juventus reached twice the final of the of the Champions League in 2018 and 2015. Uh, it's very much driven by by the fact that the the economy hasn't been going in Italy for 
more than a, than a decade. And of course, again, the introduction of financial fair play and therefore uh, the fact that there were not that sort of support that many clubs have, have received in the past from their previous, uh, previous owners, leaving aside that there are structural issues related to the uh, limited ownership of uh, stadium, stadium in Italy. If we look at the difficulties that AS Rome, Inter Milan and AC Milan are facing with the construction of, uh, uh, of their new stadium, it, it again proves the, the difficulty that, uh, that football is, uh, is facing in, in Italy. But I, I do think that if, uh, if uh, first of all, I do agree uh, with, uh, with what Dan has said, that uh, the creation of what we would call it a private super league, which is detached from, let's say, the current UEFA competition, in my opinion, is also not going to happen, exactly for the reason that you were saying. So there are logistic and regulatory difficulties to the implementation of, of such a model, a model that would be close to an American league. I also don't think that uh, the, the European fund would, would accept uh, a model in which there are guaranteed places, there is no relegation, there is no promotion into this type of competition. It, this is part of our uh, sporting culture. So we are not, I think, yet ready for something, uh, something like that. And uh, the American market is accustomed to it. We are, we are not. So that, that's the way I see it. I do also think that the creation of a private Super League uh, is more of a negotiation tool uh, from some of the big clubs to basically try to get uh, a better deal uh, from UEFA. But I do also believe that the reform is actually needed. Uh, there is a, a need for more big international clashes. Uh, there is a need to stabilize the cash flow and to have a more predictable profitability for some of the big clubs because the level of investment that has been made by many uh, shareholders into this club has been massive. And I think from their perspective, it is fair that they want to have uh, a certain minimum expected level of return on investment. Um, so I do think that we will see a change after 2024 and uh, the Swiss uh, competition model um, in which uh, 10 matches will be granted to all the clubs participating to the Champions League being 32 or 36 as to be seen is possibly a good, uh, a good way uh, to increase the total number of matches and the level of excitement of uh, European, uh, uh, European uh, matches. But I think that is also fundamentally important for our audience to understand why there has been this change. And the reason is, again, linked to the fact that there has been a transformation of the media market and the creation of the OTT platform and the access globally to any sort of football match throughout the world at any time of the day, independently from where you are, at basically very low cost, if not for free, has basically changed completely the landscape of football. It has created true global brands. And if you take, for example, a Hungarian, a Polish, a Nigerian uh, fan who is in his own country and he has the chance to watch uh, the Classico or uh, a Manchester United uh, Bayern Munich, and at the same time there is a local match, he is he's suddenly finding himself to compete with, with those type of match. We have a limited stock of leisure and entertainment time, and of course we want to spend our time uh, watching the product that is most exciting. And I think that uh, we need to realize that this industry has become global, is not going to change, and therefore uh, we need to make a product that is entertaining and is attractive to the global market. That's a good way perhaps in, uh, Dan, towards um, the impact of COVID, um, because what we've seen in the um, broadcast industry in particular around football um, is new ways, perhaps ways have been brought forward earlier than they would have been in terms of technologies, uh, OTT broadcasting. Now, even the smallest of uh, of clubs uh, are able to live stream their matches to their fans. And we're talking about very small clubs, semi-professional clubs with, with barely 2,000 fans on a regular basis are live streaming their 
matters. Um, in terms of an outcome of COVID on football, uh, from what Andrea is saying there, you know, are there going to be greater opportunities for fans to consume their teams um, in, in perhaps a way that uh, so far they've only been able to do in terms of watching the big Champions League matches? Is, is, is it going to open up football or is that going to absolutely you know, kill it off? How will broadcasters perform, do you think? Look, I think that's a really interesting question because I think the, 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 the point of view of the broadcast in this is, is, is fascinating. Um, so I agree with what Andrea was saying about you know the, the global audience uh, and what you've just alluded to, Andrew. I mean, going back to when I was talking about you know the nature of football and if you were to invent it today and what an amazing you know a development it would be and how brilliantly suited to a digital you know 2020s. I, I think that's definitely true. The, the challenge with something like OTT and that sort of universal access and as Andrea says, you know, whether legitimately or through a pirate stream, you know, the ability to access it at, at low or zero cost. I think you're seeing a couple of things. So, you know, that those global fans and indeed a younger generation of fans might, because of scarce leisure time, you know, want to consume clips and highlights and, you know, receive alerts and, you know, watch for a, a few seconds rather than a, a full 90 minutes. That that element, I think, is definitely on the rise and, you know, is, is becoming ever more open gradually as to how that works. But the bit where the most value still is, is obviously with the main live 90 minute um, broadcast. And the challenge, I think people are still struggling a little bit with OTT. And again, going back to the history of when clubs were listing on the stock market, the thing that, uh, that was driving a lot of that at the time was people were saying, wow, you know, just imagine if um, if Manchester United are playing and they've got however many million fans around the world and they all just pay five dollars each. You know, look at the numbers that you generate. And so the arithmetic of that and the basic logic of that is is quite straightforward. But the history to date and even now coming up to looking at what the French are trying to do with Liga and, and Telefoot at the moment is that it doesn't seem to work like that. It's it's not like a one-off big boxing match where people subscribe for a pay-per-view by it, it, it's hard it's a it's a more habitual season long thing rather than a one-off purchase and so there is a real balance and a tussle there for the for the rights holders the clubs and the leagues selling their rights and for the broadcasters and for new emergent potential you know broadcast platforms as to how does the economics of this actually work and i don't think that's been worked out yet on the subject of you know, fans being able to stream the game and so on. Look, it, it's great. Um, and all of us, I think, recognise that it's brilliant to have something, you know, that enables an OTT service where, you know, the production values might not be the greatest, but if I'm a displaced expatriate, um, you know, fan of a Serie B club who's living in the States, I, I can find a way of being able to watch my team's games. I, I think that's that's brilliant. Um, what I don't think it's a substitute for, and actually what watching games that have been broadcast during the pandemic has shown, is it's not a substitute for being at the game, and for being live. And, you know, the, 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 the pace and scale of return the fans to Stadia, I think has been even slower than many of us would have feared six or nine months ago. But hopefully, particularly by next season, we're back to a much more normal situation. And I think there is a huge amount of pent up demand. People obviously have safety concerns and so on. But you, you look at the games recently where a crowd has been allowed in and actually you look at the enthusiasm of those crowds, despite sort of social distancing and being deterred from cheering and so on. And what that's also done for the atmosphere of watching a game. So I think, you know, people sometimes get very blase about the live audience, about, you know, the match attending fans and say, oh, they're less important than they've ever been because, you know, it's a smaller percentage of the revenue and all this stuff it's still the most visceral way of experiencing watching live sport and from a point of view of being a broadcast viewer the thing that makes you lean in and really care about what you're watching is the fact that there are tens of thousands of people there who are deeply passionate clearly about what they're watching and the noise and the excitement and so on so i do think that you know whatever the future of broadcast holds the future of match day attendance is is very closely tied up with that if, if we ever get to a point where you know, people are blasé or not fussed about going and watching the game live in a stadium, then we have a massive problem. Yeah. Andrea, let's bring ourselves round to the issue then of uh, COVID. Uh, you, both of you are right across the uh, the figures and the current state of play with, with football and finances. Um, is there any 
evidence yet of uh, six months on really from March where most countries sort of began to think about lockdowns. Um, is there any evidence yet of the impact that it's had on, on the football landscape? Yes. Um, well, there have been a certain analysis that has been undertaken by the ECA and uh, the estimate for the season 1920 and 2021, so the combined two seasons that are hopefully the last two to be, or the two to be only affected by, by COVID, uh, the impact on the revenue is in excess of 5, million, uh, 5 billion uh, um, euro in revenue and on the bottom line is in excess of 6 billion. So it is, it is a massive, uh, massive uh, impact. I also think that uh, the major impact of COVID is uh, on liquidity. There is a huge issue of, uh, of liquidity at club level, um, especially for the mid-size and, uh, and, smaller, uh, and smaller club. And the, all of this leaving aside, the devaluation of uh, of players' value, which has all uh, has definitely come in during uh, uh, during COVID and has been witnessed during the last uh, um, transfer transfer season uh, in the sorry the summer the summer transfer window. So the impact the impact the impact has been uh, has been massive. I just look at uh, I, I take the numbers because uh, I I cannot remember by heart. But I, I got my team to look at the financial statement of 13 major clubs that have been uh, published. And they are Celtic, PSG, Porto, Benfica, Sevilla, Real Madrid, Rome, Juve, Borussia Dortmund, Ajax, Tottenham, and United. So this is a sample of 30 major clubs in Europe. The bottom line moved from accumulate profit of 230 million in the pre-COVID season down to 623 million losses. So basically, approximately 800 million of, of profit are, are gone. Um, but one point I would like to make in the context of, uh, of the COVID, uh, um, let's say, effect of the COVID on the, uh, the football industry, I, I believe that the industry already pre-COVID also show some flaws because you are basically looking at the sector in which, let's say, for most of the club, leave aside maybe 15 clubs or 20 clubs in Europe, you basically have an operating model in which 60, 70 percent of your revenue are covering salaries. So the model in itself with inflated transfer fee, inflated salary, going agent fee, already presented a, a, some flaws pre-COVID. What COVID has done has basically magnified the limitations of, uh, um, of the business, of the business model of, of many clubs. So many of these clubs were already in a difficult position. In, in, in the moment they would have faced a relegation, they would not qualify for international competition. Of course, now with the uh, stadium being closed, and certain clubs losing tens of millions. If you take a club like Barcelona, for example, pre-COVID, they had stadium revenue of 175 million euros. Those revenue are gone, and they're not going to come back. And it's not only the revenue that are associated to, to, to the stadium, but it's also the revenue associated to merchandising when people are going for to visit the stadium for the stadium tour for the museum so the impact is massive as well as the impact that is having on the sponsor and especially the smaller sponsor that are benefiting from the exposure of the brand in the stadium itself so it for certain club especially the one that are highly dependent um, on uh, on stadium revenue, the impact is certainly huge. But I want to reiterate that even pre-COVID, there were certain issues. However, I also want to add that I don't think that if the pandemic would have not happened, certain investment, I also believe, would have not happened. And for me, the perfect example is what has happened with Serie A, with the sales of um, 10% 
of uh, the um, of the rights um, to CVC and Advent, but not as being only a sales of 10 percent of uh, the media rights uh, um, for a period of 10 years to private equity. It's the loss of control of the league and basically passing the control of the media rights sales to uh, private equity, which is something that I think in pre-COVID times, it would have never happened in Italy. Yeah. yeah. Um, Dan, what are the headlines from you in terms of the effect that uh, COVID has had on the, on the football scene? Yeah, I think, as Andrea said, I mean, there are clearly some very big numbers floating around on this. Um, the, the, the Bundesliga came out the other day talking about a you know one billion euro impact. Um, I think MLS in the States likewise has, has come out with big numbers. Real Madrid was saying, you know, if you'd asked them a year ago what they thought their revenue would be for this season and asking them now what they think their revenue will be for this season, the gap's about 300 million euros. So, you know, clearly a huge, huge impact. I mean, we produced our annual review of football finance back in June. Uh, in many ways, one of the most challenging, uh, we've done a lot of those, um, but probably the most challenging year we've ever had to produce one because we were we were talking about a season uh, in in um, 18, 19. Um, which was sort of a normal season, but clearly we were writing it in the midst of a pandemic and knowing that, you know, 1920 results were were on their way. And, and then also you're going to have a 2021 season to come, which was also going to be obviously heavily impacted by COVID. So th the picture is, is is tricky to split out, but but basically what we felt at the time was the the dip for the 1920 financial year reporting was going to be particularly acute. And that was partly obviously because the pandemic had started, but partly also because obviously the season stopped. And what normally happens is that football clubs' financial years and their football seasons coincide. So it's nice and neat and tidy for the likes of myself and Andrea and our teams doing our analysis. You have a financial year and it mirrors to a football season and it's nice and easy to, to draw the conclusions. This time you had a financial year that broadly for most teams kind of covered about three quarters of a football season. And then you buy by virtue of the fact that then there was the catch up over the summer and then this very congested calendar for this football season, you're gonna have a financial year that we're currently in that's gonna have five quarters of a football season. It's got yeah. a quarter of last year's and all of all of this year. So we expected an acute dip and then a sort of V-shaped recovery and bounce back and then onto a, a growth trajectory again, albeit probably a more shallow growth trajectory than what we've seen in the past. Clearly, writing that back in June, um, if I fast forward now to where we are in December, the return of fans to stadia has been slower and in smaller numbers than we assumed at that time. You know, we knew it was always uh, going to be very hypothetical, but we were thinking at that time that, you know, fans may be coming back in numbers at the start of 2021. At the moment, that feels pretty ambitious. I think we're all thinking if we get back to a situation where we've got something like full stadia for the start of next season, we'd be doing very well. So I think, you yeah, know, the impact is acute and extreme, um, but what that's done, as Andreas rightly said, is it's created a short-term need, a liquidity need, that's attracted investment. But the, the, the sort of light at the end of the tunnel is that the fundamentals do remain as they were and, and strong. And therefore, I think that after two very, very difficult and very challenging years, we'll come out of this into a point where, again, we may see clubs setting record le revenue levels again um, as early as next season or you know, within a couple of seasons thereafter. The very interesting thing will be to see what that does in terms of reshaping how they, they manage for risk in terms of their financial risk around how they structure player contracts, et cetera, and, and sort of cost controls around that. So I, again, you know, going back to the financial fair play point, had, had COVID hit, in a pre-financial fair play era, you know, the, the the financial picture would have been even messier than it already is. And I know, Andrea, one of the things that you have been looking at is the impact of player transfers uh, and the impact that COVID is going to have on on that, because the, the passage of players around uh, Europe in particular, but also players going out to play in, in the, uh, the American leagues, in the A-League in Australia and Japan, um, the whole mobility of the population perhaps is going to be less so post-COVID than it was before. Is that going to have an impact uh, on, uh, on transfers, do you think? Well, we have already seen in the, in the summer transfer window, and I think we will see at least uh, for a few transfer window next winter and probably next summer and maybe even the 2022 
um, transfer, winter transfer window. Uh, basically, what we have seen is uh, many more swap of players, many more loans with future uh, buy option, uh, more extended payment terms. They were already quite extended pre-COVID, but they even further extended simply because there is no money. The, the, the biggest issue that the industry is facing is, uh, is uh, liquidity. And above all, we have seen uh, a devaluation of the of the players. Uh, we do monitor uh, the value five times per year, the value of 5,200 players in 12 different leagues. And if we, if we take uh, the 500 most valuable players that we have in our tool and we compare their value in February, so pre-COVID, um, to today value, the decrease has been 10.3%. If we look at this value in May, uh, early May, when we did the, the first uh, update in COVID time, and when there was still uncertainty on whether or not uh, international and national, com national competition will resume, the devaluation was uh, above 19%. So we have to consider that uh, football players are the main, the most valuable assets of any, of most football clubs, let's say. Um, and, and this devaluation is having an impact on them, especially for clubs that are very much relying on player trading activities. So some of the Portuguese club, Belgian <coughs> clubs, Dutch clubs, and a few other clubs also in big five leagues. I can think in Italy, for example, um, Atalanta, Udinese, and in Spain, I can think of Sevilla and a few others. Those clubs are somehow impacted by the devaluation of their key assets because they've been realizing profit from the disposal and the trading of those of those players which nowadays uh, they, they're going to decrease so whether they can afford to wait for better time and uh, and hopefully the market will go back and the players value will will appreciate but that could also be a quite risky risky strategy and it all of course depends from the liquidity position of every single club Transfer is clearly going to be a big thing, Dan. Does this mean that, uh, I don't know, Paul Pogba, will he stay at Manchester United despite what his agent might want? <laughs> uh, well, look, I, mean, I, I, I made a resolution a long time ago that I wasn't going to try and uh, second guess the movements of individual players or, 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 or their <laughs> agents. Um, good, 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 uh, good bar conversation, but uh, once more, we actually get back to those, uh, those times again. But I mean, just picking up on what Andrea was saying there about the, 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 the values in the transfer market, I, I think. What's interesting in that is that it very, very co closely correlates with sort of what's happening on revenue and what's happening, you know, in the wider economy. I mean, the, the sort of numbers that were being talked about there of a 10% decline, I think, you know, like Andrea, looking at clubs' results as they're coming out, I think we we think that that probably is about the like-for-like -like decline, is, is, is that it's been a 10% hit to revenue. Of course, the problem in a in a football club particularly is that that hit goes all the way straight through to the bottom line so everything you lose off the top in revenue goes straight to the bottom line and because even with the slightly better financial disciplines we have now than we had 10 years ago there's not a lot of people who are making massive profits even the ones who are profitable are marginally so or breaking even so that that goes straight through to the bottom line but going back to where we were back in may when you know everything was so much more uncertain um i think you know there was a real doubt at that point you know when professional football would be able to restart and if it couldn't restart how big a broadcast rebate would there would there have to be and so on so i'm not at all surprised that the the dip in player valuations at that time was even even heavier i think what we are already seeing and and we will see in windows to come again is just a trend that was already there around swaps around loan deals and around polarization within the player market so the the elite really top players you know if they come onto the market, there will still be, you know, a handful of very interested parties who will still pay top dollar for them. But the more sort of squad player, you know, and not to demean those players, you know, they're probably very high class international footballers. They're probably among the top thousand people in the world at what they do. Those are the values that I think are going to erode more. And then below that tier, you know, it'll be it'll become a bit of a rarity to see players moving for a fee. I think you know, at the sort of lower professional levels. 
like any referee, I, I always have to have one eye on the time and we're up to almost uh, an hour. It's been a fascinating uh, debate and a fascinating conversation with your expert knowledge and I'm sure it will continue uh, on social media. The ISC will be uh, tweeting this and I'm sure you might want to uh, hear what people have got to say. But let's just have some final thoughts as we move into a uh, time added on for stoppages. Uh, Andrea, let's, let's start with you. Um, looking ahead then to 2021, um, what's your sort of thought on what the football landscape is is going to look like we've touched on many aspects of that i know but can you think of one particular change do you think that football fans might have to get used to um from now on because of what we've seen in the last year i think that football fans basically have to get used to the fact that, that uh, the football industry it has become an industry is not anymore uh, only only sport and that uh, club owners are thinking very, very often as shareholders and they want to have uh, uh, a return on, on investment. I think it's just simply too romantic to think, at least for the very, very big club, that football is like it used to be 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, clubs have become, as I said earlier, media and entertainment company, and that basically has changed the mindset of uh, the management has changed the governance of football club and to certain extent and i also say sadly it has also changed the way fans are also treated fans are fans but sadly fans are also seen as consumer dan your take on this is to perhaps one outstanding thing that people will look for as being yeah that 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 was the biggest single change post covid I think it, you know, it's a much overused phrase over the last few months, but I think what we're going to go back to is we're going to go back to a new normal. And I, I do think it's going to be remarkably similar in lots of ways to the old normal. I think probably the, the match going experience for the first few occasions, I think will be interesting. It'll be interesting to see where that settles to. Um, certainly, you know, going to a match now is if you're one of the 2000 people lucky enough to go into a game in England at the moment is a very different thing to, to what it was this time last year. But I actually think an awful lot will return to how it was. Just that match going experience, I think, for certainly the duration of 2021 will will look and feel a little bit different to uh, to what we were previously used to. But actually, I think it would just be fantastic if we got to a point in the year's time where going to football and engaging with football. Dan, thank you very much indeed for your contribution today. Dan Jones from Deloitte and Andrea Satori uh, from KPMG. Thank you both very much indeed for joining us. It's been a fantastic discussion. We're very grateful to you both. Thank you. Thank you.